From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty is the first African-American woman on the Portland City Council. She was elected in 2018. However, Hardesty has pushed for police reforms and racial equity for decades as an activist and state legislator long before she became commissioner. But now she says people at all levels of government are finally listening. What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! What happened in Minneapolis on Memorial Day got their attention when a white police officer killed George Floyd, a black man, by kneeling on his neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. It prompted widespread national protests and calls for justice and racial equity. In Portland and beyond, tens of thousands of people have marched in peaceful protests, calling for reform. But late at night, a second group has often clashed with police outside Portland's Justice Center on a near nightly basis for weeks. And this week, those protests got even more complicated and political when President Trump sent federal officers to Portland. Last weekend, one of those federal officers shot a protester in the head with what is described as an impact munition, seriously injuring him. And here to share with us her thoughts and perspective on where we go from here and her vision for community safety, welcome to my guest, Portland City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty. Welcome back to Stray Talk. It's nice to have you here again. Thank you, Laura. It's a pleasure to be back. You have long been a voice for police reform and racial equality, but now your voice has been amplified like never before. We have seen nearly seven weeks of protests following the death of George Floyd. How would you describe this moment, Commissioner, where we are as a city and moving toward racial justice and the kind of reform you're looking for? Uh, well, we don't have enough time for me to tell you the whole story, Laura, but let me just say that we are in exciting times. We're in times where our community knows that our justice system is fatally broken. They know that uh, racial justice is not um, uh, realized as of yet, even though it's been a dream for many, many, many years. Um, but I guess what I'm most excited about is the ongoing energy to demand change. People know now that Portland Police Bureau fundamentally needs a reset. Um, if we are, Portland Police are um, abusing, tear gassing hundreds of people because a couple of people did something inappropriate, we cannot allow that to continue. And so as you, know, as you said, uh, we have reduced the police budget we are in the process now of finalizing a ballot measure that will take police oversight out of the hands of police and put them in the hands of community members. We will also be working to ensure that the Portland Street Response, which now has been funded for six pilot sites, will be operational as soon as COVID is under control. Uh, I am so excited about where we are now but I also don't want to mislead the viewers because we still have an awful lot of work to do. And I want to hear more about your vision in just a moment. But first, I do want to ask you about the incident we saw this past weekend involving federal officers and protesters. And we're going to show video of what happened. But I do want to warn our viewers the video is graphic and disturbing. A federal officer shot a protester in the head with something hey, called an impact munition, seriously injuring him. And Commissioner, we've also heard reports this week that federal officers are in town. They're policing, arresting people without the explicit permission of local authorities. What do you think you can do to make sure a serious injury doesn't happen again? And what are your thoughts about the presence of federal officers? I want them out of here. I, we do not need federal officers to exacerbate uh, the conflict between the community and the police. Um, I have been terrified at thinking about what will happen or what could happen with these federal agents. As you know, they have no identification on them, so you don't know if they're Homeland Security, if they're ICE, 
if they are uh, DOJ. We just don't know who these people are. And the sad part about this, Laura, is I just uh, was on a call with Senator Jeff Merkley, and he has no, he can't get any information. He's asked for a very specific information. They also are using war weapons. We don't know what's in the tear gas that uh, these uh, federal officers are using. But what we know is that in the middle of a pandemic, gassing people every day will have a huge impact on their respiratory system. I want to ask you, uh, Commissioner, the acting chief of Homeland Security just today on Thursday condemned what he called the violent siege in Portland. He released this statement. This is part of it. The city of Portland has been under siege for 47 straight days by a violent mob, while local political leaders refuse to restore order to protect their city. Each night, lawless anarchists destroy and desecrate property, including the federal courthouse, and attack the brave law enforcement officers protecting it. He goes on to say this failed response has only emboldened the violent mob as it escalates violence day after day. And he says this is a acting security, Homeland Security Secretary Chad Wolf. He goes on to say that they offered assistance to local and state authorities if they want it. And he vowed that they will stay and protect federal property and the people inside. It looks like they're not going anywhere. Where does this end? What is the solution, do you think? Well, unfortunately, uh, it appears that uh, 45 sent these um, uh, and thugs is, is not an overstatement. Uh, and I think he purposely sent them to cities that are perceived to be liberal uh, so that he could actually interrupt uh, this upcoming election cycle. I would not be surprised to see troops ending up in places like Seattle uh, and in places like Atlanta, uh, because uh, this particular person in the White House just has no concept of how to engage community in a meaningful way. Uh, my, again, it is my hope that as the city council continues to do our work, that we will be able to plug people who are really concerned about police reform into the work that we have to do. Because we have a lot of work to do and not a lot of time to get it done in. Let me, let me ask and you so more that's about my the, hope, and I've said this to you. Let me ask you mm -hmm. more about the protests, though, that, that go on, the, the more destructive ones late at night. They go on night after night. There have been calls from the governor and the mayor that they should stop, but protesters say they'll continue until they see change. Do you want to see these more destructive protests end? Are they distracting from your message? No, I don't think they're dis distracting from the message of we have a very uh, flawed criminal justice system. I think what has happened is people of color have been saying this for years. I personally have been saying it for 30 years. And I think what's happened is that white people are starting to see that if a couple of people are being disruptive, a police response is to gas and intimidate and injure hundreds of people. And so I continue to say, if people are involved in criminal behavior, police officers know how to arrest people and charge them with criminal behavior. I do not think that there's a good protester and a bad protester, but what I think, what I know is that most nights the police overreact because honestly if you are in riot gear from head to toe and somebody throws a water bottle at you you don't feel it and just because your feelings are hurt doesn't mean you attack hundreds of people let me ask you this I, and week, again what i think is going to resolve go ahead go ahead what do you think will resolve this oh i was just gonna say, yeah i think what will resolve it is giving people very concrete things to do this week, I published uh, the, a first draft of my thinking around what community safety looks like. Okay, let me let me stop and you right there. we're going to create work groups. Let me stop you right there because I do want to get to that, but I have a couple other things I want to ask okay. you before that um, okay. about these encampments. Okay. Demonstrators right. set up right. encampments in Lounsdale Square and Chapman Square across the street from the federal courthouse and the Justice Center. And today, police uh, ordered everyone out. They cleared it. They closed the parks. Was that the right move? You know, I don't think it is. I think all people are going to do is go to another park. I mean, it's not like people are going to stop protesting because somebody decided to close a park. I, you know, I, people have a right to protest. 
Um, and it's ironic that people are protesting police violence. And where do we get more violence from police? And now we have federal police violence. So I, I think I, I don't think that's going to change the dynamic at all. Well, what about if they were to try to establish this autonomous zone like we saw up in Seattle with CHOP? Should that be allowed? No, we're not going to allow a, a autonomous zone. I mean, people have to be able to use our streets in the ways they are intended. But again, th that has nothing to do with protests, right? And no, I, I, I'm not looking forward to an encampment. Honestly, we have hundreds of people on our streets because we have nowhere else for them to be. So uh, adding more to that, I think is not a good idea. Some Portland business owners whose businesses have been, they say have been hurt by all the demonstrations that their, their businesses are boarded up, uh, have, feel like city council should be doing more. Let's listen to what they have to say. I think, I mean, mainstream Americans, uh, the silent majority, we're, we're, we're actually kind of tired of seeing these um, anarchists destroying our city and we would like to see uh, yeah, the police step up and take care of these people. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I was patient at first and I understood why the destruction was happening, but it's still happening and it's hurting us so bad. Commissioner, is there more that city council could be doing to assure businesses and people who live and, and visit downtown that it's a safe place to do business and to come down and visit? Well, let me just say that uh, downtown Portland looks like a ghost town during the day most days. Um, and let me also say that the reason that businesses are shut it up is because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Many of the boards that you see downtown uh, were put up as a proactive way to make sure that people's windows weren't broken out. Um, I have been downtown. I can tell you graffiti can be removed. So when federal officers use rhetoric around violent graffiti, I'm trying to figure out what is a violent graffiti, right? Graffiti is a, is a, is a statement. It's a political statement. It is not violence. Um, and I think what people should know is when we are able to safely uh, conduct business uh, um, in a way that creates the physical distancing, um, what we will see is that people will be able to go wherever they would like to go. Is it safe to go downtown today? Absolutely. I can tell you that every morning, uh, Portland Clean and Safe and, a, and um, the uh, Emergency Command Center goes out and sweeps downtown so that it just looks perfect. Um, the reason why downtown is empty is because we still are in phase one of opening. And as you know, the COVID-19 numbers are going up radically and black and brown people are first impacted and worst impacted uh, by COVID-19. Let's so look at your- I, You know, I sympathize with businesses. Let me say, I, I sympathize with businesses who have experienced loss because of the protests. Uh, most businesses downtown have insurance, so they will be made whole. There are other areas of the city who are uh, suffering those same losses and they will not be able to recover from it. I do want to take a look at, at what you, uh, your vision for community safety. You released this, this this week about reimagining community safety, and you call for reducing and limiting the size and scope of our police force, reinvesting those dollars in the community, yes. creating alternatives to the police, decriminalizing nonviolent offenses, and demilitarizing officers. Uh, when you say reducing the police force, um, how many uh, officers would you like to see cut? I think they're about 900 now. Uh, yes, there are about 900, and I forget the number. I think we cut 60 plus positions out of the budget this year, and so that means they should be down to nine, uh, 840. Um, I don't know yet what the right number is, but what I do know is that what we tell police we want police to do now, they are not the right people to do it. That's why Portland Street Response will be so significant when we're able to get it off the ground. What we need to do is reimagine what safety looks like. Many people do not feel safe with armed, heavily armed people uh, who are sworn to protect and serve. So what is the job of a police officer? A police officer has one job and that is to solve crime, that's it. But we have police officers acting as if they're mental health professionals. 
We have them acting as if they're housing specialists. We have them acting as if they are counselors. Police officers do not have those skills. So guess what? Let's hire the people that have those skills to intervene in those ways. I imagine when I think of community safety, I think preparing the community to address minor disagreements will do a lot to stop people from calling 911. As you know, the significant increase in 911 calls is about unwanted people, basically houseless people who have nowhere to go. Um, and so police should solve crimes and we should create a first responder system that responds to the needs of the community. So I don't have a number yet. I can't tell you what's the magic number. Um, this is just my best thinking at the moment. And I'm committed to talking to community members all over the city of Portland to find out what their idea of community safety is. As an example, I think if we're not looking at law enforcement from a public health perspective, then all we're looking at is trying to criminalize as many people as possible. And we have had a gang enforcement unit that operated for 14 years, and we've had no impact on gangs. We just started a gun violence reduction team, which of course I eliminated, helped eliminate in the budget. Again, we are having no impact on gun violence. So why is gun violence right um, on the rise? It's on the rise because people are uneasy. We are headed to an economic uh, a cliff. We Many people are unemployed. They have not received unemployment. Uh, many people are um, in fear of being evicted at the end of September. And so tensions are high. So I'm not surprised that guns are being shot when tensions are high. And so what we have to do as a community is address the core issues. Police officers with weapons cannot solve the economic downturn that we're in. And uh, we should mention, we did have a record number of shootings uh, in August. We have had 42 shootings uh, that you were mentioning there with all the shootings. But we need to take a break right now, Commissioner Hardesty, but we'll continue our conversation right after this. We're back in two minutes. And welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. And welcome once again to my guest, Portland City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty. Thanks again for being here, Commissioner. My pleasure. I know you're working on this ballot measure you mentioned in the last segment. It uh, calls for a new police oversight system to take the place of the current independent police review and the citizen review committee. And you're working with a number of community members to get this on the November ballot. What's wrong with the current system? And I know there are a couple of other ideas to replace it. Why is your idea best? My idea is best because the flaws of the current system is that it was developed based on the assumption that only police could hold police accountable for wrongdoing. Um, my system will allow the community to hold police accountable for misconduct. Uh, what I have seen over the last 14 years with our current system is that there is a huge lack of trust and transparency and honestly investigation. I don't feel like regular people get a fair shake with the system that we have today. And so a new system would just mean that we would take it out of the hands of the police and the police would investigate some internal issues, but primarily we should never have people investigating themselves to determine whether or not they have been involved in wrongdoing. Does it have to be on the ballot or is this something that three of the five commissioners could enact? Great question. It does not have to be on the ballot. We could implement it today. But since I've been doing this for 30 years, I know the police union will fight it uh, 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 nonstop. And so it is better to put it on the ballot and have a proactive conversation rather than being in a defensive mode. 
let's talk about the new city council. Right now there's just four of you. We have a special election coming up on August 11th to replace the late Nick Fish's seat. Loretta Smith and Dan Ryan, that election's August 11th. They will join you right away. You were telling me the very next day. And then we have a couple of runoffs coming up in November yes. with the mayor and Sarah Iannarone, also Chloe U. Daly and Mingus Maps. What are you looking for in the new council? What do you hope for? I am excited to think that the next city council in January, the majority of the city council will be non-career politicians. They will all be people with a deep root in their communities um, and not tied into the way we've always done things. So I am very excited by this new leadership because I absolutely know that in January, the dynamics of the city council will be uh, a lot different than the traditional city council dynamics have been. Mayor Wheeler is the police commissioner and he has deferred to you many times recently on police policy and budget issues. How do you think he's doing as police commissioner handling that job? Well, let me say that uh, he and I don't always agree about what the appropriate steps are to address our current crises. Um, great example. A great example is I actually um, on Sunday, I talked to him early Sunday and said, Mayor, I think it's important that you put a statement out now. As you know, um, it took him all day because he met with his staff and he talked to some business owners and it took him a while. Um, and um, that's unfortunate. Because and you're talking about when the federal officer of shot the protester. Crisis, that is correct, right? Um, and most of the time, I mean, I, Ted Wheeler has come a long way um, from when I first got to the city council as it relates to the need for police reform. Um, but I do believe that he must demand that the federal troops leave our community. And I will continue to push him and encourage him and challenge him um, on the future of policing. As he and I continue to talk about this, I've been surprised that he and I are pretty much on the same page about the need to be intentional, the need to be inclusive, and the need to make sure that what we put in place is something that will be beneficial to the community. Do you think he should be reelected? I do. I, I do for many reasons, primarily because I do not believe Portland can stand one more one term mayor. And because you can't get anything done in four years, you can think you know what you're going to do until you get inside City Hall. And that's certainly been my experience. There were things that I thought made perfect sense when I was outside advocating. I get inside City Hall and it makes no sense at all. So what I know is that it takes time to really understand the bureaus that you're responsible for. And it takes time to move institutions. And so I believe that the next year is uh, the next term that Mayor Wheeler has will be where we will start to see some significant changes within the place. So it sounds like you're endorsing him. Would you have and any... maybe I'll end up with a I'm sorry, what did you say? I've already endorsed him. Yes, it I, is... I was going to say, and maybe I will end up having a police bureau. Well, I wanted to ask you that. We only have about a We're minute left. Those Do you want to have the police bureau? No, I've never wanted it, but I think that there's some logic in having all the first responder bureaus under one commissioner. And I would take it because, as you know, we're, we're doing this transformation. So if the mayor offered it, and I just said last week that I would never take it under any circumstances, but the more I think about aligning our first responder services, because honestly, first responders don't do a divide and say, I can't do this because I'm fire in your place. Um, so uh, we should not have leadership that actually separates our first responders. And so I'm starting to warm to the idea of having the place in my portfolio. When might that happen? Uh, well, the mayor and I are continuing to have conversations. As you know, we work very closely because he has one first responder bureau and I have three. So we work very closely coordinating our work around these first responder bureaus. And we've started having those conversations. Well, and he said he's thought about it. I never thought about it. 
I need to stop you there. We're done? out of time, but please come back because there's so much more okay. to talk about. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching. There is so much more. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. And don't forget to download our new podcast and join me next week when my guests are Loretta Smith and Dan Ryan. Have a great week.